Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Lori Wingard. In our show tonight, we'll celebrate Nurses Week in Hawaii. First, we'll visit with the Hawaii State Center for Nursing at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. We'll find out how evidence-based practice works and how the profession is changing. Then we'll attend the Center's Celebration of Nurses Week in Chinatown on First Friday and meet some of the evidence-based research team members there. To start, we spoke with Stephanie Gentz, a member of the Evidence-Based Practice Steering Committee of the Center for Nursing and the Dean of Nursing at Chaminade. So evidence-based practice is taking the best of what we know, looking into the literature, looking at the research, looking at our patient, what their needs are, what their assessment is, and then providing care that is based on all of that evidence. For a long time, uh, and even maybe now, if you ask some nurses, if I'm a student and I'm on a unit with a nurse and I say, why do you do it that way? And the nurse says, well, I don't know, because we've always done it that way. How we've always done it does not mean that that is the best way. It's not maybe the highest quality way. It's not maybe the most efficient way. It's not maybe the most cost-effective way. Um, and it might just not end in the best result for our patient. How we treat skin wounds, for example. We have had over the years multiple kinds of treatments for different kinds of wounds. But let's say we have a patient with a specific wound and we're applying a treatment. And we want to make sure that that treatment is the best treatment for that particular patient. We look at what's out there. Um, if there's enough in the literature that we can use, that's good. And if there isn't, then we might actually have to do a research project to build some uh, additional knowledge about that particular treatment. In the last five years, six years, we're really starting to infuse evidence-based practice into the curriculum to make sure that they not only know what evidence-based practice is, but they have opportunities to use it. Having symposiums, having events like the one that's happening on Friday evening, that creates a venue. Nurses need a venue like that to be able to come and see what's happening. Another piece of it is, is to have it published. Once you uh, have a finding, it's important to get the word out. So there's really two tracks. You know, there's the, the school of nursing, the nurse educators who are educating our new nurses about evidence-based practice. And then there's what the Hawaii State Center is really doing, which is to educate nurses who are already in the workforce about evidence-based practice. They're actually making some history here, I believe, and really are in the forefront, but a number of initiatives that are really advancing nursing in Hawaii in ways that I don't believe is happening elsewhere on the mainland. Then we spoke with Gail Tiwanak, Executive Director of the Center for Nursing and a longtime advocate for the nursing profession. I'm the Executive Director for the Hawaii State Center for Nursing. The center was established by the Hawaii State Legislature in 2003. We have three mandates. One is to collect and analyze workforce data. The second is to develop programs for retention and recruitment of nurses. And then our third is to conduct research for best practice on best practices and quality outcomes. Our evidence-based practice uh, program is funded as well as supported by the Hawaii State Center for Nursing. Every other month, the teams get together to review their projects. When nurses are able to actually um, sometimes take a step back and take a look at their population, the patients that they're serving, it means they're taking the leadership to see how they can make a difference or make improvements within the system or within their practice. Well, the team themselves um, have a process, a model, that they follow, an evidence-based practice model that they follow, and, each, and so there's stages of their um, project and there's an evaluative phase, and there's also a reporting phase. Um, and each of the projects, you, if they involve patients, have to be reviewed by an internal review board. They get that support for 18 months, and they meet regularly um, every other month for at least a full day. Our goal is to move the teams to, to completion, hopefully publish, 
share that information, as well as present it local or national conferences. We now have advanced practice registered nurses who go beyond their um, bachelor's degree and are able in the state of Hawaii to really be a primary care provider. So they can act and, and prescribe drugs. So they can actually provide care in communities that uh, may not have access to some of the, to the primary care providers, but also to specialties. Mm -hmm. um, so. They're, they're filling a real need. I spent most of my career in practice. Cardiology was my specialty. When I went to nursing school, I wanted to be a pediatric nurse. That was gonna be my specialty. And when I went into my pediatric rotation for my nursing um, degree, I saw lots of very sick children, babies. I thought, I don't, I can't. I can't be in this specialty. It's too hard um, to see children suffer. And I think many nurses who um, go through school, but also go into the different clinical settings, have that same experience. So nurses in hospice, there's, I mean, every nurse is special, but it takes a, a little bit more <clears throat> um, emotional in, investment when you're, you know, you're dealing with dying patients on a regular basis. Well, Friday night is to, um, part to, to kick off um, Nurses Week. It's Nurses Day, and we are going to showcase our um, some of our evidence-based practice project teams. Many of them with a great deal of pride and um, a great deal of success as well. And uh, we want to share with the community what work they've done and how they've made a difference. And we spoke with Deborah Mark, nurse researcher at the Center and assistant professor of nursing at the School of Nursing at UH, and Joan White, coordinator for evidence-based practice at the Center. So let's uh, let's talk about these uh, studies that you do for best practices. You yeah. know, the evidence-based best practices. Uh, uh, I guess that that is the subject of the day because I, I guess that is the you know the iconic advance of the profession. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, nurses have always and will always want to improve their patient care um, to improve outcomes of patients. We have also had some um, serious initiatives by the federal government to improve health care. Um, we've had many reports where we are, um, where patients are being um, put at harm in healthcare um, settings. By, by doctors or by nurses? By oh. everyone. By the system. Um, medical errors, yeah. et cetera, yeah, system errors. Um, so evidence-based practice has kind of grown out of that. And also the feds have, the federal government has, are getting a little tired of funding research that doesn't get applied at the bedside. And so evidence-based practice has been borne out for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. We've talked about it, but it really has gained momentum, at least here in the state of Hawaii. Um, and nurses have found it as a really great tool to use the research that's available, kind of synthesize it, put it all together, and ask themselves, okay, what are we doing now, and what is the literature telling we should do differently? And that's what they're taking to the bedside and changing practice and improving patient outcomes with. Do you know anybody uh, who is as excited about it as Joan White? <laughs> I would say yeah. I'm almost as excited okay. as Joan White. <laughs> Well, and our <coughs> practitioners are too. I yeah. mean, we have, and you will find out for yourself, our teams are just passionate about this. And more importantly, within the culture of their organizations, those organizations are becoming passionate about it. And they have some very good reasons for being. For example, um, the federal government, as Deb said in some of those reports, are uh, very concerned about uh, what are called nosocomial infections or hospital acquired infections. And they want those to be reduced dramatically in the coming years. Uh, falls is another one. You saw that with uh, medication errors. They have quickly changed the system to address that problem. That's exactly what we're doing here. And we have much better patient outcomes. The patients are happier. There's less, sometimes less pain and discomfort involved in the interventions. They have shorter length of stays. The cost to the hospital goes down. The insurance companies are thrilled. And overall, there's a much better result for everybody involved in the system. That's huge, Jay. It's more than just evidence-based practice. It's education. 
it's an awareness, yeah. you know, of, of the growth of medical knowledge. Yeah. And uh, I think it makes nurses um, feel they, they're involved in a, in a perpetual education which has got to be a side effect, at least, of this process. Absolutely. It's one of the wonderful consequences of this project that we've um, found is that it is like a, um, I hate to say a virus because that's <laughs> only, uh, no pun intended, but it does, it does spread. Um, and nurses that initially get involved with this continue to do it with other with other projects. Um, and then um, one, of the, one of our faculty members, Dr. Judy Carlson, um, told our recent class, she says, once you've finished this workshop, you are ruined forever because you will <laughs> never see your nursing practice the same way again. Um, you will always ask, what does the evidence say? If you observe things in your practice that call into question the standard of care that's being practiced, it is incumbent upon you to look at the scientific li literature worldwide and validate either that what you are doing is correct or go forward and conduct a project that will help to establish that the care you're providing needs to be changed in, in a certain way or maintained for your patient population in your facility. The third um, project title on the list you gave me, <laughs> I'm just picking one at random. What are the best practice guidelines for pain management of residents with dementia? Well, this is a, a, just a remarkable project. Yeah, awesome. Um, Chris Manabog actually took the team and um, she um, engaged the entire staff at Liahi Hospital to work on this project. But she was the team leader and they noticed that there were inconsistencies about how they were assessing pain in patients who were cognitively impaired. It's really hard to assess pain in those kinds of patients who can't communicate or are disoriented. And so they went to the literature and they found um, a guideline actually that was nationally sanctioned and that they hadn't been using for this particular population and they implemented it in their unit for their cognitively impaired patients. And in order to implement it, they had pharmacists because it had uh, pharmaceutical implications, nurse aides because they were the ones who were actually with the patients. Um, everybody in the facility got were engaged in that. I picked a good one then, huh? Yes. You did. You did. <laughs> it's huge. They're all great, though. Yeah. It's, and it's very, very exciting. And uh, actually, she'll be there on Friday night, too. Finally, we attended the Center's Celebration of Nurses Week in Chinatown on first Friday, May 6th. Uh, I'm uh, very honored by this presentation, and it's been my pleasure to support nursing in the House of Representatives and in the legislature. And I think we've made progress, and, and particularly um, last year and this year with our uh, APRN legislation. And um, we actually are one of the most progressive uh, laws in the nation. And I'm really proud of that. And I'm proud of the Center of Nursing because the Center for Nursing, uh, the kind of research that's being done and the kind of um, activities that I see are being uh, carried on are really very wonderful. Thank you so much for this beautiful award, and I would like to present you with an award. So, <laughs> this is given to you, to the Center of Nursing, on behalf of both the House and the Senate. And if I can, I just read a little bit from it. Um, the Hawaii State Center for Nursing is honored for promoting excellence in healthcare. Since its inception in 2003, the center has been working to ensure that the people of Hawaii receive the highest quality health care possible. We're really, really proud of the work of the center and the work of um, all of you involved and of the work of all the nurses in our state. We should be proud that the state of Hawaii is becoming a leader in nursing. <laughs> um, it's very exciting um, to be able to, to accomplish uh, some of the things that have been needed in the legislature and in the state for a long time. We have passed a bill for the advanced practice registered nurses that allows them to be independent practitioners. So we also just passed a bill in the legislature um, for a medical health ban on the big island. And, and what advanced practice registered nurses are doing is actually providing 
primary health care to people in the rural areas. Nurses are, are taking on a whole new role, I think, in our communities. Our focus was primarily implementing a trauma-informed, coercion-free system of care for children and adolescents in the psychiatric treatment program. We heard about some innovative strategies, and we were concerned that um, we were using interventions that, you know, didn't necessarily help some of the kids and may, you know, maybe not so much harm them, but had uh, other negative outcomes with the staff. We were really looking for a better way or a newer, more innovative strategy of working more collaboratively with patients. And most of the research on the core strategies was done for us. Uh, there was a nurse who's, who's very renowned. Her name is uh, Huxhorn, actually. Uh, and she, in, in collaboration with a few others, developed these six core strategies. And our project is focused on how do we sustain and, and what are the best practices for really getting this uh, proven strategy to stick in workplace settings. Extubation is uh, when we have children in the hospital who require a breathing tube and a ventilator to breathe for them. Extubation is the process of taking that breathing tube out and allowing them to breathe on their own. When we looked at the kids that um, were extubated, we didn't have a lot of kids that actually failed extubation. What we had was um, mixed practices by the physicians and different comfort levels of the nurses. What we do is we go out and we do a literature search and we, and we look at all of the research that's out there currently established for pediatrics. And what we found is there's not a great wealth of knowledge as far as pediatrics. A lot of the pediatric guidelines are based on adults and what they do on adults because nobody really likes to um, experiment or do research on kids. So when we did this survey, um, besides wanting to make it the most successful for our patients, we also wanted to make it work, work for our nurses and our respiratory therapists as well, to make them comfortable with the process and to make it so that everybody's doing it the same way. I'm hoping it'll be done by the end of this year. So I'm hoping to have uh, the guidelines finished and rolled out by summer and then we can reevaluate at the end of the year and see if there needs to be any tweaking or any change in our guidelines. You do do this for professional satisfaction. You do this because you love where you work and you want to make where you work the best possible place for the patients as well as the nurses that you work with. So you do these projects for everybody. So what we're doing is that we're trying to assist our patients to recognize if they have diabetes or not and helping them if they do have diabetes and helping them recognize it, manage and treat it before surgery so that um, they'll have a faster recovery and also to promote, um, to minimize the risk of surgical site infections. We primarily, it's hyperglycemia, so we treat them to see if they have a high blood glucose greater than 200, at least 200. And so from there, we try and treat them before surgery and continue to manage it if they are hyperglycemic after surgery and throughout their hospital course. We use um, medical journals, nursing journals, whatever we could find that was related to our project. And then we critiqued it and we came up with several things that they, were, that they had in common. And so from there on, we, we created a guideline that pretty much still needs approval within our organization so that we can roll it out. Every two months we have a meeting, so they help us, they coach us along with our, we let them know what our process, our progress is, and they continue to support us. We hope to pilot this July 2011, so it's a process. We're not really sure how long it's going to take, but if it does well on our unit, then we hope we can do it organization-wide. So the problem we have is pain uh, for our post-op patients and we were trying to look for more alternatives that the nurses could use uh, in order to help the patients out. So um, looking at complementary and alternative modalities, we found that music and relaxation were two very good alternatives that the nurses could use. So um, we decided to choose those two to assist with pain management, not take away narcotics because we cannot take those away from surgery patients. but. 
to add on the music and the relaxation. We um, had to go into different databases, several different ones, and with the help of the AAA librarian, we were able to pull out several articles, and every time we go in, we keep pulling out new ones because there's a lot of information out there. We surveyed the entire staff on how they felt about music and relaxation. Did they think that that would help the patients? And they said yes. They absolutely said that it would help. We also surveyed, we told the doctors that this is what we had in mind to do, and they were 100% behind it. I was actually surprised. I wasn't expecting music therapy and relaxation to be actually as helpful as it turned out to be in the literature. Um, whenever a patient would tell me, hey, I'm in pain, what can you do for me? And I would give them the morphine, I would give them the pill, and then I would reposition their leg, I would give them a cold pack, I would give them a warm pack, and then I was out of options. And I thought, okay, there's got to be something out there that I can use to help in pain, uh, with pain. So Tripler offered me a class on evidence-based practice, and I took it, and here it is. So. <laughs> All in all, with the assistance of the Hawaii Center for Nursing, the nursing profession in Hawaii is standing tall and becoming a leader in evidence-based practice across the nation. It's great for Hawaii to have these dedicated nurses and educators to lead the way. We are very appreciative for their efforts and for their contributions to the improvement of medical care in our community. And now here's our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. On May 26th, ThinkTech, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, and Pacific New Media will present our 2011 legislative review, taking stock of the events and results of the legislative session. Was the budget balanced or not? On June 23rd, ThinkTech, HVCA, and Pacific New Media will present Hawaii's big projects. Are they on track? Reserve your seat for these programs at either hvca.org or thinktechhawaii.com. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. Let's have a really terrific Spensation today, okay? <laughs> I'd love to, Jay, but the news was that the legislative session is over. It went quietly, like it a lamb. It went so quietly. In <laughs> fact, this has been one of the most uh, lackluster uh, sessions that um, I've seen in many years. There was uh, not a lot of fighting. Uh, gambling reared its ugly head and, and was shut down, as usual. A couple of early uh, accomplishments with civil unions and mm -hmm. the education board. You know, the challenge of trying to find $1.3 billion in the budget put a damper on things. The only things that could get done were things that didn't cost money. That list was uh, pretty short. But the governor seemed, um, in his statement after the session closed, a little disappointed as well. They made progress towards a new day, but then uh, he commented that the special interests still have a, a major influence on the legislative process. Uh, so he's trying to lick that in the, in the coming months with private partnerships with the government. Good for him. So I think that's a good strategy. Yeah. I mean, he's really got courage, and uh, he doesn't mind going up against anybody if he thinks he's right on the point. But, you know, uh, I, I wonder about the projects. Uh, first reports are that the cable bill did not pass. Um, that's a huge project, and now it's going to have a hard time. It's already stuck, and now it's going to make it more stuck. And then you think of all the projects that 
that nobody paid any attention to major projects that are not happening because the legislature was too busy looking at, at the budget. It's really, uh, it's kind of a quiet time in Hawaii. It is. It's very quiet, and it doesn't sound like much is going to get get done, especially the big projects. Yeah. And that's a topic that we're going to tackle at our June meeting, yeah. HVCA Think Tech meeting on why the projects are stuck. Uh, but in May, we hope to have some more intelligence for you when we do our legislative wrap-up. That's only a couple of weeks away. I think it's important that we do wrap-ups like this, you know, and sort of take a hard look at it and find people who talk about it candidly so that we can know what's really going on. I, I think first reports are probably correct. Nothing much happened. And, and what's you know, ironic about it is um, arguably the budget is balanced, but is it really balanced? You know, there's all kinds of exceptions to the rule. There's all kinds of funny pockets of money and uh, obligations that aren't getting handled. Even if they say it's balanced, I'm not so sure it's balanced. <laughs> That's right. It's really hard to tell. Yeah. A lot of positions are uh, still funded but unoccupied. A lot of funny numbers that uh, hopefully we'll find more information about in the coming weeks. And if we're not going to increase the tax rate, uh, we've got to improve the economy. I'm not so sure that the, the economy is much more diversified than it was 10 years ago. I'm afraid not. There's still a lot of pushback, Yeah. still a lot of reliance on tourism, yeah. importing people to spend money rather than exporting goods and services. Yeah. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation. Jay Scheidler, through the Scheidler Family Foundation, supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including ThinkTech. Hawaiian Electric Company. Kiko and its affiliates, Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island, are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company which has a large presence in and commitment to Hawaii. Oceanit, a local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. Okay, Lori, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week, just the way Duke Obishi does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a sponsor. Help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Lori Wingard. Aloha, everyone.